The Earmax Center is proud to present the SFU Canada Research Chairs Seminar Series. This bi-weekly series hosts six presentations per semester. For the fall 2009 semester, the presenters belong to the faculties of Applied Sciences, Arts and Social Sciences, Business Administration, and the Faculty of Education. Today's speaker is Dr. Mary Ellen Kelm, Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Peoples of North America, Department of History. he told us was large cardinal numbers. These are numbers that are so big that they may, might not exist, and he lived in constant fear that somebody, probably a graduate student, he said, would one day prove they didn't exist and his entire career would be meaningless. Um, we're humanists, so we kind of have adjusted to the fact that if things we study don't exist, it's kind of okay. But for mathematicians, this is really terrifying. Um, we get to partake in a similar sort of terror this morning. The title of the talk is, What's the Point of Cultural History? And I think some people in this room, including myself, are a little bit nervous that there could be a negative conclusion, that there may not be a point, and then everything we've done is uh, suddenly very problematic. I'm slightly reassured because the person who's going to make this determination, our speaker, has a distinguished career of cultural history, and I don't think she's going to shoot herself in the foot by coming to it when I'm okay. I'm not nervous again. Um, Mary Ellen Kelm did her PhD at the University of Toronto. Her dissertation was published by the University of British Columbia Press, Colonizing Bodies, Aboriginal Health and Healing in British Columbia. It won the Sir John A. Macdonald Prize from the Canadian Historical Association. She was then founding faculty of the History Department of the University of Northern British Columbia. She there uh, prepared two edited volumes, one in the Days of Our Grandmothers, which is a collection of scholarship on Aboriginal women's history, and the second is the Letters of Margaret Butcher, um, Missionary Imperialism in the North Pacific Coast. And I'm very familiar with this because I teach the history of Christianity. And every year, at least one student comes to me and says, I've discovered the most fascinating missionary imperialist. I say, yeah, I know, I know who you're thinking of. Um, in 2006, she came home to SFU, where she had done her master's, um, to take up this CRC chair. Her work on rodeo is being prepared for publication by University of British Columbia Press, not quite pre-purchasable, pre-orderable, but we're getting a preview today, I think. Um, my math professor, who was terrified, always used to say, thank God for tenure, because whatever happens, if his work is meaningless, he still has a job. Professor Kelm has tenure, and she has something even more valuable. Um, her work is really immediately and compellingly relevant. Um, Aboriginal issues, health issues. She's an investigator on the UBC um, Northern and Rural Youth Sexual Health Team. Sexual Health Team. Um, I can remember, again, as an undergraduate, I had to do an interview for fellowship. And one of the people on the interviewing committee didn't see the point of history, not just cultural history, but any kind of history, and said, why should we fund history when we could be funding cancer research? And I, my answer was, I didn't have an answer, huh? I wish I knew Professor Kelm then. I would have had a much better answer. Why don't you join me in welcoming me, Mary Ellen Kelm. So I want to begin by thanking Vesselin and Pam for organizing the series and for inviting me to participate. Um, Luke for his kind introduction, and my colleagues in history and across the university for attending, and finally to acknowledge the Tsleil-Waututh people on whose unceded territory we are sitting, or you're sitting and I'm standing. Um, two weeks ago, Canadian uh, citizen and immigration minister Jason Kenney announced the publication of a new guide for immigrants entitled Discover Canada, the Rights and Responsibilities of Citizenship. In this 62-page document, arts and culture get a page and a half, including a sidebar on Canadian football. Most of the content is not, surprisingly, superficial, and some of it is actually confusing. Marshall McLuhan and Harold Innes, pioneer thinkers, we are told, are shoehorned into a paragraph on Canadian advances in science and technology, for example. <laughs> 
Given our current government stand on the arts and culture, I suppose we should be grateful that they were included at all. Perhaps I don't need to remind you that during the 2008 federal election, conservative Prime Minister Stephen Harper defended cutting $45 million arts in arts funding uh, in the country on the grounds that ordinary Canadians were not overly concerned with culture. Just this fall, British Columbia's Liberal government announced that it would not be directing $10 million raised through the province's Gaming Commission to community organizations, cultural institutions, and sports programs throughout the province, amounting to a significant and in some cases crippling funding cut. While the British Columbia government did not justify its actions as Harper did on the grounds that ordinary British Columbians did not care about sports, not the message to send in this year of the Olympics, the roar of protest from across the province certainly indicated that ordinary British Columbians care very much about culture in all its forms. They care about culture because they know it builds communities. This is a skill testing question. I'll come back to it at the end. Um, and so today I'm going to talk about how rodeo did that in various small towns, rural communities, and reserves that came to embrace the sport. I also want to talk today about why understanding histories of culture in our country is important, using rodeo history as an example and how the work of cultural historians can contribute to more complex understandings of ourselves as Canadians, particularly in the West. So I'll begin with the work Rodeo did to build communities, literally in a concrete way. Early in the 20th century, town elites across Western Canada identified Rodeo as one way to attract settlers, investors, and tourists. In 1906, when a group of lady journalists visited Cardston, Alberta, the mayor took them to see a bucking contest as a way of demonstrating the excitement of being part of a growing, vibrant community. Stampedes became ways to advertise regions open for settlement and small towns hungry for new residents. Early programs of the Williams Lake Stampede advertised the region's natural resources, rangelands said to constitute the last great west, mineral riches, timber, furs, and the, quote, wonderful scenery and historic value that will be a mecca for thousands of tourists. Furthermore, the 1928 program told readers that Williams Lake was now the convergence of all the highways in the province and the new Great Pacific Eastern Railway and was an emerging business point for ranchers, miners, trappers, tourists, lumbermen, and the fine business accommodations and a prosperous, contented population. Rodeos offered regional boosters a chance to speak both to the primitive opportunities of the surrounding district and the distinctive modernity of its towns. Staging a successful stampede, moreover, attracted much-needed cash to circulate through flagging rural economies. Stampedes at Williams Lake and Lethbridge, Cardston and Kamloops competed for the spending power of visitors who jammed restaurants and auto courts, campgrounds and grandstands. Lethbridge's 1935 Jubilee Stampede added $15,000 in wages, con contracts, supplies, and prize money to the local economy. 150 temporary workers were hired for a total of $4,000 in wages, where preference was given to married jobless men and unemployed veterans. Lethbridge merchants made substantial profits through the sale of lumber, hardware, decorations, food, and drink. Moreover, these merchants then made cash payments and taxes to the city so that it too benefited from the infusion of cash. Tourists flocked to the town and contributed their own share to the financial success of the event. New venues built for stampedes advanced a town's image. Improving the grounds and grandstand at Lethbridge taxed the finances of the Stampedes Organizing Committee in 1918, but when they were complete, organizers boasters boasted that now they had one of the finest racetracks and grandstands in all of Western Canada. New buildings like those completed at Cardston in 1914 and renovated at McGrath in 1921 promised to be venues for other events throughout the year. The ability of a town to offer an array of entertainments was a selling point and added a competitive advantage over other towns vying for settlers and investment. Stampedes acted as fundraisers for some improvements and catalysts for others. A rodeo promise for Kamloops promised proceeds to go to the hospital fund. An editorial in, Southern Alberta, in a Southern Alberta paper reminded readers that some mighty fine projects had been aided and built by Stampede profits. Businesses spruced up their storefronts in time for the annual stampede, 
municipalities worked on roads and lobbied the provinces for better highways, sure that tourists attracted by local rodeos would pay for the investment. But what ensured that a stampede would be successful? At the core of Western Canadian stampedes was the presence of cowboys and Indians. It soon became apparent to rodeo organizers that local contestants were much preferred by audiences who rejected a Wild West show style event brought from the U.S. Western Canadians, who were in the early decades of the 20th century very likely to be American by birth, were rapidly building a sense of themselves as Westerners living in environments that were like, but not the same as, the American Plains. Becoming a cowboy in Canada was about adaptation and change, and local cowboys embodied that. Stampede Press and programs all emphasized that local contested contestants represented the local region. As the High River Times wrote, the crowd that follows the thrilling stampede sensations from year to year has come to look for all kinds of nerve and dash from these boys, and their appearance is greeted with tumultuous cheers reserved for old friends. They do their full share of upholding the supremacy of the original cow country, and through their riding the name of High River is known up and down the continent including First Nations, also drew on the tendency of rodeo promoters to see Indigenous peoples themselves as attractions. Indeed, as they discovered when government tried to prevent such displays, the presence or absence of Aboriginal people determined the financial fortunes of many small-town events. As early as 1905, citizens of McLeod and Lethbridge invited local Kainai men, women, and children to come to their fair and to parade dressed in traditional regalia, offering prizes for the best attired. The Kainai responded enthusiastically, and soon they became, quote, the leading attractions of the fairs. The Indian agent for the Blood Agency went so far as to remark that at, quote, at, McLeod's, at McLeod in 1907, the Indian show was practically the whole thing. The ordinary fair features of the white people were quite insignificant. That same year in Lethbridge, some 300 Siksika, Pikuni, and Kainai men, women, men and women walked in the parade to the delight of onlookers. The federal government, not surprisingly, opposed such displays. Amendments to the Indian Act in 1885 and 1894 had outlawed ceremonial dancing, but Indian agents found it hard to enforce the law when local businesses and town promoters were paying Aboriginal people to perform. The federal government pressured towns, particularly on the prairies, less so in BC where the potlatch was the source of concern, to stop inviting First Nations. When that did not work, the Department of Indian Affairs officials put forward an amendment to Section 49 of the Indian Act, prohibiting ceremonial dancing off reserve and requiring that any Indian going to a stampede receive the consent of the Indian agent first. A roar of protest ensued from small towns across southern Alberta. From Brockett to McLeod to Lethbridge, fair organizers denounced the law and pressured local Indian agents to grant permission for Aboriginal people to attend, prompting one official to conclude that, quote, it seems to me that the Indian is being exploited and people have gone stampede crazy. Some local people shared the government's concerns. The Alberta Indian Commission of the Methodist Church alleged that, quote, when the Indians took part in affairs, they licked up fire water in such copious fashion that they were useless for the rest of the year. In addition to the after effects of their exhibition jags, they also became swollen up with false ideas of their importance, and as a consequence, mission workers found them almost unmanageable." End quote. But Southern Alberta fair committees, like the Lethbridge Agricultural Society, issued notarized statements to the press countering that only a handful of arrests for drunkenness were ever made, and in fact more white men than indigenous men ended up in the drunk tank. The latter complaint, that Aboriginal people were swollen up with their own importance, seems much more salient, and was a view often repeated by missionaries and Indian agents who perceived an increase in self-esteem that resulted from successful participation um, in competitive events, dancing, riding, and in displaying women's skills with beadwork and sewing. Indigenous people voted with their feet attending, by attending, and stampede officials were financially reliant on them to do so. In the early years of the ban, fairs and rodeos ac across southern Alberta went bankrupt. Some, like Lethbridge, amalgamated with other towns to try to make ends meet. In the face of persistent protests from settler fair and stampede committees, the government faltered. 
The softening of the government's position in the early 1920s changed the fortunes of many small-town fairs. As rodeo gained popularity, stampede committees stressed that their contests were, quote, open to all. In an attempt to make its intentions absolutely clear, the organizing committee of the Cardston Stampede wrote, the management this year wants it understood that our friends from the Blood Indian Reserve are open to enter any event on par with any other contestant, concluding that, quote, all events were open to all Indians in 1926. The mayor of Cardston went further, announcing that all Kainai could go to the stampede for free. Later, when the stampede was over, manager Jack Galbraith made this statement, Cardston's Indian friends from the Blood Indian Reserve were of great assistance too, for entering into the spirit of the day with energy and finest friendliness. The Indian cowboys took their full share of the burden of entertainment for the great crowd of spectators, and incidentally captured several of the leading prizes of the day. All across southern Alberta, small town stampedes worked hard to attract First Nations, both as grandstand attractions and to compete in rodeos. They included them in planning committees, at Cardston, the Stampede Sports Committee held open two positions to be filled by Kainai representatives of the band's own choosing. Lethbridge's Golden Jubilee Committee of 1935 included a number of local Aboriginal leaders, including Chief Fred Tailfeathers, Cross Child Shot on Both Sides, Frank Red Crow, Owns Different Horses, and John Crow Eagle, who joined the, the usual array of businessmen and town fathers. The enthusiasm of small town planning committees for Aboriginal participation made it exceedingly difficult for Indian agents to deny their requests, though some did. Even the tough-minded Deputy Superintendent Duncan Campbell Scott reported that he found it to be a situation that was, quote, very difficult to control. Brian Titley has argued that the growth of stampedes in Western Canada seriously undermined the Department of Indian Affairs' efforts at cultural suppression. In British Columbia, Aboriginal participation in rodeos grew without interference from Indian agents. Indeed, they supported sports in general on reserves. The Indian agent at Williams Lake and the missionary at St. Joseph's Mission nearby both served on the Stampede Association's board of directors and occasionally acted as judges for the events. First Nations participated in community events wherever they were organized in British Columbia, from Dawson Creek in the north to Windermere in the south. Johnny Napoleon of the Peace River Country, Johnny Smiley, Andy Emanuel, and Gus Godfreydson in the Kamloops area, Joe Elkins, Nels Chelsea of the Caribou Chilcotin, Harry Shuttleworth of the Similkamine, and Jimmy Baptiste of Incomete. Each region had its share of Aboriginal cowboy heroes. They dressed up and vied for the best dressed Indian cowboy and cowgirl con contest at the Kamloops Rodeo. They provided rodeo stock and helped organize events. They made community building stampedes happen. And so it might be said that the grandstands and the hospitals that Stampedes built, and of which so many small-town Western Canadians were justifiably proud, would not have been built without the contributions of nearby First Nations. Rodeos built communities in other ways as well, and here the cultural work of rodeo is much more troubling. For in regional centres, small towns and rural communities in the Canadian West, rodeos told stories mainly about struggle and opposition between humans and animals, but also between settlers and indigenous peoples. Through their parades and programs, grandstand entertainment, and implicitly in the contests themselves, rodeos performed scripts of domination. They displayed what Elizabeth Furness has called the frontier cultural complex that justified the dispossession of Aboriginal people, the unfettered extraction of natural resources, and the ascendancy of white settler societies. As such, they fit into larger patterns of cultural formation, including public celebrations and commemorations that divvied up the world into binary opposites of deep provenance, orients and occidents that were unchanging in their racial and cultural essences, situated in distinct temporal zones called primitivism and modernity, and demonstrating lack or plenitude of the key characteristics of the liberal governing subject. In so doing, Rodeos contributed to the imaginative production of communities. In the first half of the 20th century, the focus on racialized segmentation on white ascendancy permeated events from the parades and the pageants and the programs to the rodeo contests themselves. Committees used parades to advertise their attributes, often, as Mary Ryan has argued, performing social structures that were, they were in the process of building. 
Small town stampede organizers use the parades to visually situate the progressive and well-serviced communities in an illustrious past of Aboriginal people and pioneers, and the order of the parade told the story of advancing civilization. Some stampede organizers placed First Nations up front in their parades to honor their indigeneity, but most stampede organizers deployed them as exotic remnants of a foregoing time, and quote, a good drawing card for a good cause. Lethbridge's parade of 1926, entitled From Red Man and Buffalo to Joyous Present, began with Kainai and Pikuni on foot and horseback and moved on to include a procession of Red River car carts representing Métis settlement, <coughs> Northwest Mounted Police riding in their Red Surge, early missionaries and fur traders, all in advance of floats built by businesses and churches, service organizations that completed the Three Mile Exhibition of, quote, the passage of time. By the 1920s, stampede parades, while still relying on Aboriginal people and paint and feathers, also included participants who more clearly represented the contemporary period and explained to visitors, as the Lethbridge Herald did in 1926, that, quote, today on their reservations, they are rapidly discarding the dressing customs of their forefathers and adopting those of their white neighbor. They are now successful farmers and stockmen, and not a few of them are driving cars. McLeod's Jubilee Stampede of 1924 included Aboriginal men and women riding, quote, polka dot steeds, drawing children in travois, followed by the Blood Reserve Marching Band, displaying rational, organized masculinity, and the naturally dressed cadets and girl guides from the Blood Reserve bringing up the rear. In stampede parades, Aboriginal people were often, but not exclusively, portrayed as foils for modernity. Pageants offered a more fixed performance, depicting histories of place crafted and revised in the process. At the Williams Lake Stampede, for example, in 1928, organizers staged something they called an exact reproduction of an actual Indian massacre, which was a loose representation of the Chilcotin War. The program told a muddled version of the events of 1864, in which Chilcotin warriors killed a crew of road builders intent on connecting the Caribou gold fields with the beauty, with the sea um, through Butte Inlet, confusing the Hudson's Bay Company factor Donald McLean for a scout and mistakenly describing the ill-fated Hudson's Bay Company Fort Chilcotin as a hastily erected outpost. Both the only thing that the story of, that the story of the Chilcotin War as told by the Williams Lake Stampede got right was that the Chilcotin were tricked into surrendering. The pageant had six scenes, including an Indian attack on a stagecoach, a sun dance in which Indians celebrated their victory, and a final scene that was to include the presentation, quote unquote, of three Indians who took actual part in the massacre. The irony is that no Aboriginal people actually took part in the pageant. The Indians who burned Fort Chilcotin to the ground were well-known white ranchers and townsfolk. Lethbridge staged a similar pageant for their 1935 stampede that traced their history from the wild days of Fort Whoop Up to the present. Here, too, white men dressed as Indians burned the fort to the ground, while other white men rushed in to save white women dressed as Indian maidens from a sure and ghastly death. Rodeo contests themselves were organized along racialized and gendered lines, a system that both highlighted the presence of indigenous people and women and that stressed their difference. But the lines were never quite so clearly drawn. Women could and did compete against men in events like Roman racing, Whoops. Oh, no. Aboriginal women protested the conditions of competition in races like the, quote, squaw race, also held at Williams Lake by simply not entering. And indigenous cowboys, as we have seen, entered and won events that were, as rodeo promoters claimed, open to all. Indeed, there is much about the cultural history of rodeo that is about hybridity, about mixedness, as there is about the construction of categories like cowboy and Indian. Rodeos built communities in the longer term, but they also built communities, sometimes fleeting, sometimes more enduring, at rodeos themselves. The very presence of Indigenous people at small town rodeos across the Canadian West created a contact zone that, as Mary Louise Pratt, James Clifford, and Donna Haraway all remind us, produced new, unexpected, and sometimes surprising and subverting forms 
For one thing, it's quite clear that the definition of cowboy in early 20th century Canada embraced both indigenous and settler men. Emergent identities for the rodeo cowboy organized around poles of rough and respectable manhood and complicated even these categories. Rodeo cowboys might drink and fight, but they also collaborated, sharing equipment and first-hand knowledge about stock, pooling resources of the, on the road, taking care of one another in injury, banding together in defiance of unscrupulous rodeo committees and unfair judges. Sarah McFadden, daughter of rodeo announcer Cy Talon, remembered her father as living, quote, rodeo to rodeo, making just enough money to keep us in gas and hamburgers. But if we had extra money, everybody drank. And when we rented a room at the motor court, a luxury, cowboys bunked down on the floor with their saddles for pillows. While not entirely a homosocial world, it was nonetheless a masculinized sphere in which indigenous men had some access and from which they took a measure of honor and prestige. When Tom Three Persons, a Kainai cowboy well known to Southern Alberta audiences, won the Bronc Riding Championship at the Calgary Stampede in 1912, the town of McLeod minted a medal in his honor, the Governor General telegrammed congratulations, and the Kainai Secret Society, All Brave Dogs, inducted him into its membership. As one Indian agent wrote with some displeasure in 1917, the fact that Tom Three Persons, a blood Indian, won the belt and championship at the Calgary Stampede in 1912 has been responsible for the condition that every boy on the blood reserve between the ages of 17 and 23 wish to be a second Tom Three Persons, and all they think about is saddles and chaps and silver spurs, race and bucking horses, a full equipment of which makes him a hero in his own eyes and in the eyes of admiring young women on the reserve. Men like Tom Three Persons, Pete Bruisehead, Gus Gottfriedson, and Dave Twan took their places alongside emerging rodeo stars like Slim and Leo Watrin, Herman Linder, Leonard Palmentier, and Pete Knight. Official rodeo records and newspaper coverage designed to capture the results of what was rapidly becoming a popular sport make clear that there was more to rodeo than a crude conflation of cowboys with conquest. Rodeo as a cultural event popular with small towns also permits other stories to emerge. The obsession among local heritage buffs for inclusion, as John Bennett and Cena Cole write, of every person, sorry, force the inclusion of every person who settled or even wandered through the area and all the people and things that must not be forgotten. This inclusion ensures that other non-dominant narratives will come to the surface. R.D. Theiss calls these other stories micro-narratives. They are defined as alternate, often oppositional, to the dominant meta-narrative, but they are also likely to be meta-narratives, or the main storyline for the people who produce them. These micro-narratives include stories and images that emerge from the edges of the documentary record. The illustrative anecdote of the Indian agent wanting to prove to his superiors the malicious influence of stampedes on the racial order of the West is one example. For Kootenai Indian agent Helm Singh, what was alarming were the feelings that were aroused both in settlers and in indigenous peoples at stampedes. <coughs> he recorded what he saw at Windermere in 1922. Quote, white men of supposed good standing and white women of similar class were seen to be arm in arm with Indians of the opposite sexes at the dance in the evening. And dancing was continued until a way late in the morning. So you can picture for yourself the effect these conditions have on the, on the, on the natives. He went on to exclaim that he had no idea the extent of the freedom granted the Indians, putting them on the level of white men among white men. Rodeos built communities of feeling that exceeded the boundaries of the racializing tendencies of the era. We can hear similar stories in the reminiscences of children recorded by local heritage committees. As Lorene Harris Rome, a woman whose family farmed south of Quinell, British Columbia, recalled, the Twans, who are a native family, mingled with the Websters, who were non-native quite a lot. If you ever got three or four Twans and Websters laughing, you weren't soon to forget it. Both of these families had similar laughs, loud and happy. They were people who liked fun times, horses, and stampedes. Indeed, the West Webster spread on the west side of the Fraser was a stopping place for those traveling to the Quinell Stampede. As Jimmy Webster recalled in 1998, 
Now, when the stampede was on in Quenelle, the road in front of the ranch was full of wagon after wagon taking Chilcotins up to the races. These Chilcotins, they were great riders and great sportsmen. They'd stop at the house to get this and that and shoe their horses because they knew we had horses, horseshoes lying around. Dad would give them stuff and sometimes he would trade with them. This happened every year. Trying to understand what it must have felt like to be among friends at a stampede is more difficult to grasp. Sentiment by its very nature is fleeting. It's tempting to theorize that sentiments that stray from the scripts of colonization or other forms of dominance are especially ephemeral, precisely because they are so transgressive. And yet they remain in the archival record. Photographs and reminiscences, fictional autobiographies and oral histories all give voice to the feelings associated with rodeo. The work of Chao Dong Hoi, a Chinese, Chinese photographer who lived and worked in the Caribou from 1905 to 1973, is among the most compelling evidence. Hoi's remarkable photographs intersect with the world of rodeo because it was during the annual Dominion Day stampede that Hoi's services were most in demand, when Sokoten and Duck Health people, mixed heritage and non-native folk, gathered in town dressed in their best cowboy clothes. In the more formal portraits, such as the one of Redstone Chief William Charlie Boy and his wife Elaine, the Sokoten couple look calmly into the camera, their faces relaxed. In other photos, Hoy captured the carnival feel of the stampede, as when a young Henry Rocky of Alexandria posed smiling with a bottle of whiskey held in his beaded gauntlet-covered hands, or in the photos of an unnamed white woman stood laughing, who stood laughing with a pistol slung on her, sa sla her sash around her waist, her dress and gauntlets fringed in buckskin. Hoy also captured something of the contact zone that was inherent to events like Quinnell's Dominion Day Stampede as well. Camaraderie pervades the photo of a group of cowboys that included Quinnell's blacksmith Jimmy Lazarin, his Chinese and Aboriginal contemporaries, including Harry Boyd, Captain Mark Mack, Chief Michelle, Moffat Harris, and Morris Malise, who grinned broadly at the camera, their gauntlet bedecked hands jauntily placed on their hips. Just as their clothing mingled Aboriginal with Western styles, so too did the white, Chinese, and Aboriginal people who gathered at Quinnell's Dominion Day Stampede offer images of mutual enjoyment, playful pleasure, of friendship, and more intimate relations. But it was not just friendships that were kindled at stampedes, but rivalries too. Sometimes the racialized and gendered segmentation put contestants into untenable and uncomfortable circumstances. Okanagan writer Christine Quintaskett's semi-autobiographical novel, Kojowia, The Half-Blood, depicted the promise and the perils of a day at the stampede. Quintaskett's central character, Kojowia, was, like many stampede goers of the era, mixed heritage. The racially segmented rodeo programs posed difficulty for the young girl, as competition in the ladies' race, competitors in the ladies' race angrily asked, quote, why is the squaw permitted to ride? This is the ladies' race. And Kutana and Pendarai women, who rode against her in the, quote, squaw race, similarly gave her glances of hatred. Refused her prize money in the ladies' race and rejected her winnings in the squaw race, Quintaskett has Kojawea denounce both as tainted money. Quintaskett captured well the tensions associated with the in-between position of many mixed heritage people in the transborder West. But the stampede also provided, in Quintaskett's story, the context for the beginning of Kojawea's romance with the other mixed-blood character in the novel, Jim. In this way, Quintaskett depicted both the frustrations and the joys of the stampede, sensation that as a mixed heritage woman of the plateau, she undoubtedly experienced and witnessed herself. As for Kojawea, rodeos were, uns were the setting for fledgling romances. Treaty 7 elders recalled that with both nostalgia and disdain the relationships that formed at rodeos in southern Alberta. For some, it was where their own courtships began. Others remembered that, remind, remembered that handsome Kainai and Pakuni cowboys, quote, ran around with white girls at the stampede. For some, relationships formed at stampedes were more enduring. Hillary Place's mother equally eagerly reported on the beauty of the Williams Lake Stampede Queen of 1935. Attending the Queen's Ball later that evening, Place fir first laid eyes on Rita Hamilton, whose, quote, big dark eyes were flashing as she smiled, her gorgeous white dress set off her dark skin and her beautiful smile. 
Place's mother asked him what he thought of the Stampede Queen, and he said that he thought her beautiful, and that someday she would be his wife. Four years later, at his 21st birthday party, Place met Hamilton again, and this time they began a relationship. They were married Easter weekend of 1942. By his own account, Hillary had a handful of musical instruments and slightly less than $50 to his name at the time. Hamilton, on the other hand, in part because of her time as a stampede queen, owned her own business, a beauty parlor, and her own home with her business partner, Vi Sternhelt. Years later, Hillary and Rita Place would provide guidance to another young Aboriginal woman who became the Williams Lake Stampede Queen, Joan Palmentier. Palmentier's father, Leonard, was one of the men who started the Williams Lake Stampede, and he came to the Caribou in 1914 with his then wife, Hazel, an accomplished rodeo cowgirl, and together they worked the ranches in the area. But this marriage did not last, and in 1935, Palmentier married Josephine Gambush from the Sokoton First Nation and they took up land near Risky Creek. As the places and the palmetiers indicate, rodeos did not just reenact relations of the contact zone, they created them as well. These are rodeos micro-narratives, and they are troubling too, but in a different kind of way. These stories disrupt the stereotypes that many Canadians hold about small towns, remote and rural communities, that they exhibit more racial antipathy more segregation than urban settings. These are the stereotypes that lead to myths about burning crosses on the lawns of small British Columbian cities being, roused, being raised in the House of Commons by Vancouver politicians. There is no denying that towns across the Canadian West have had very troubled relations with their First Nations neighbours. But the stories that Rodeo tells suggest a more complicated version of the past, where everyday interactions, individual relationships, friendships and feelings exceed the narrow confines of the racialized politics of the 20th century. Cultural history, then, has the potential to disrupt the very stereotypes and categories upon which racism is based. It offers up images and examples where, in the words of Julie Cruikshank, local knowledge and social action are mediated by dialogue, and where people and communities are changed by the stories they hear and the stories they tell. These stories have also made us aware of the contradictory impulses of our age. Oppositional cultures emerge, struggle with dominant forms, and in the process, borrow from them in their critique, in their forms of consciousness, and the concepts they deploy. Discourses of difference persist, but increasingly scholars and activists demand a more complicated narrative. Thomas King asks in his Massey lectures whether it is possible to move beyond all the limiting dichotomies that ensnare Canadians. J. Edward Chamberlain similarly asserts that it's high time for us to reimagine all versions of us and them. Cultural history has made us more comfortable with the possibility that there are many narrative lines which tell us about our past. But none of these stories would exist if it weren't for local heritage societies, small town museums, elder circles, and cultural centers on reserves, and indeed the rodeos themselves that often ran on shoestring budgets. Ordinary Canadians are concerned with culture because they make it and it makes them. And in return for their efforts, they get communities that have the services they need, histories that give them a sense of place, and stories that tell them who they are, however complicated that might be. That, it seems to me, is the point of cultural history. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. We're passing around the microphone. If you don't, if you ask a question without the microphone, then people outside of this room can't hear you. All right. Um, I was just wondering. You mentioned um, the limitations that could, that you could do on and off reserve. Um, was there ever a point at which uh, people floated the idea of holding? these sorts of activities on reserve? Yeah, and this was something that I had to cut out in, in for time and space. There's a tremendous tradition of on-reserve rodeos, and <clears throat> right from, well, right from 1896, there are rodeos being held on six acre reserves. Tom Three Persons returns to his home community and runs a series of reserves in the 1920s, or rodeos in the 1920s. There are rodeos held at Nakoda, and there was an image, I think, from the 1930s um, of a a bow and arrow contest, archery contest. Um, and of course there are 
um, rodeos on reserves and the Indian Rodeo Cowboy Association and other circuits that uh, go on today. So yeah, there's a, an equally strong tradition on reserves. Thank you for your interesting talk. And following that last question, were the, were the rodeos on re or stampedes on reserves actually um, open to everybody, or were they just open to First Nations? It depended. Um, some, in, well, some opened up for everybody. Um, in some cases, they actually had judges and um, you know, timing judges and flag judges, as it's sort of we're getting into the post-1950 period, um, from local white communities in order to keep it objective keep the judging objective. Um, many of the early re rodeos, reserves on, ro yeah, rodeos on reserves, I'm not speaking clearly today, um, were organized precisely because of the tensions that you can imagine people experienced going to, to, going to rodeos in small towns. And so that was a way for um, reserve contestants to feel safe. And also to attract funding, to attract money. I mean, thousands of, of spectators came to um, one of the rodeos that Tom Three Persons runs on the Blood Reserve in 1925, and they they bring you know thousands of dollars with them to pay for food and beaded work and their money raiser too. Hi, Marielle. You said uh, uh, Elizabeth Furness, mm -hmm. but are you and Furness really on the same page? No, I would argue that we're not. We are. We are to an extent, but I, I, yeah. Ultimately, I think she's too rigid in her interpretation. All right. Honest well, answer. Thanks a lot. Sorry, I'm still asking, my, following up on my last question, which is the third, I guess, the grandchild of the questions. Um, I just wanted to ask if the stampedes on the reserves were different culturally to the stampedes, um, to, to the small town stampedes. Oh, most certainly. Uh, most certainly. I mean, today, um, reserve rodeos you know, will often include a powwow will often be run in conjunction with other events. Um, I mean, they continue to be fundraising for reserve projects, infrastructural projects, that kind of thing. Um, but they, but they, they're different and they're the same. Um, the, the parades that I talked about, you know, they, they often include um, in small towns a, a moment when cowboys who have died are honored. Well, the same thing happens on reserve rodeos. In fact, you'll see in the opening parades, at, for example, at Anaheim Lake, where you know people are are driving in the parades in honor of relatives, in honor of their family. So there are similarities, and yet there's also differences. Uh, so uh, this obviously. In Canada, rodeo culture applies mostly to sort of central Western Canada, if you were to Alberta and maybe interior British Columbia. Is there some equivalent cultural mixing? Was there some equivalent cultural mixing opportunity for the First Nations of the coast and the local white population? Um, yes and no. Um, in the early part of the 20th century, when the potlatch ban was in place but not enforced, a tremendous number of white folks went to potlatches to watch, to observe, to be in awe of. So and we haven't really probed what that looked like on the ground and how that maybe changed um, settlers' attitudes or didn't. Um, there was also tremendous mixing in economic settings and in political settings. So um, the sort of sense that I think we have that we live in a very segregated society, I think that that is a more late 20th century than early 20th century phenomenon. fascinating talk. Um, I wanted to ask a question about the recreation of the massacre at that one uh, stampede. And I'm just I'm familiar with some of the literature on U.S. Uh, Wild West shows and, and Native participants in events like that, uh, recreations of raids on frontier towns and the like. And I'm wondering if you have any idea whether Native participants refuse to, because um, they're in other aspects of that show, yes? Or oh yeah, I mean they're at that stampede. And the committee doesn't record, you know, why 
it's always, in fact, it's not clear at the time. Like, if you weren't actually present at the stampede, if you're just looking at the archival documents, as, as I was, it looked like, oh my god, what's going on here? Especially when they say three actual people who were actually there in 1864 are going to be present. But it's only in subsequent reminiscences where, where the woman who's the occupant of the stagecoach writes that it was tremendously hilarious that it was, you know, her neighbors that were burning down the fort, and it was her neighbor who saved her from the stagecoach that was being attacked by her neighbors. Um, and similarly, the Lethbridge pageant is put on by Guy Wiedek. And Guy Wiedek, who's um, the, the founder of the Calgary Stampede, and who eventually gets booted off the Stampede's uh, payroll in 1932, he goes on to organize rodeos in southern Alberta in the 1930s. And he's the one who organizes that Jubilee um, Stampede. He is a very strong believer, he comes from the Wild West Show tradition, that the only way you do pageants, the only way you do reenactments is if you have authentic people playing those roles. So I'm looking at this pageant again, and it's, it's, it's tremendously long to describe. It's like got 14 scenes, it was written by committee, and it has all kinds of crazy stuff that didn't happen in Alberta. Um, and I'm reading and I'm thinking, OK, well, I wonder who they got to play all the Indian parts. And I'm reading along and reading along and reading along. And then I get to the list of the cast. And it's all folks from Lethbridge. There isn't a single Kainai or Bakuni name in the list. So why Wiedek would go along with that, I don't know. And so I don't know whether, I don't actually know whether they're refusing. But my sense of it is that there is. And in the case of the squaw race in Williams Lake, it's quite clear. They could not get women to race. And in, in British Columbia, unlike Alberta, Aboriginal women enter um, the races like crazy. They're a huge part of the whole racing culture. So the fact that they didn't enter the squaw race, where they had to race to the end of the finish line and, and light a campfire, and then race, get on their horse and ride, the fact that they didn't enter that suggests that they didn't want to. That really segues um, into my question, which has to do with the, the difference between BC and Alberta and the regulatory power of Indian agents, which um, which seems to me to be, a, from not, not working in the field, a surprising difference given that they're under federal control. And so can you comment more on that? I think that, I mean, the Indian agents in Alberta were more mixed than I think I'm kind of highlighting here. Um, they, were, they often felt themselves to be in a very awkward position. On one hand, they did see that Aboriginal people felt way better about themselves after they came back from a rodeo, and that they weren't as amenable to management, and they were concerned about that. Even some of the good Indian agents that we know of, people like Wilson, for example, um, he makes these sorts of comments. On the other hand, you know, to be a rodeo cowboy is kind of assimilated, right? So they're kind of in favor of that. And they don't mind it when rodeos are held on reserve. So Alberta is a bit more mixed, but generally speaking, they are, they do stand in the way. And when the when federal government cracks down and says, no, you must enforce this new section in the late sort of 1918 to about 1922 or so, um, stampede fortunes plummet. They just can't make money without them. So it's clear that they actually are enforcing it. In British Columbia, they don't care about this stuff at all. The only thing they care about is the potlatch. And in most jurisdictions, they have a hard enough time enforcing that law. So they just, they don't, and they don't see what goes on at rodeos as a fluorescence of Aboriginal culture. So they don't oppose it on those grounds. Though they are very worried about the mixing that goes on. Hi, um, thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, you address a lot of local processes that drew these communities together, so things like competition, fun, friendship, economic attraction. attraction is, um, and you spoke about sort of processes that are a little bit more distant, but have local representation government, for example, in, in forcing things apart, really. And you only mentioned briefly a couple of times the role of religious um, structures in the community. And it seems like that might be something that also sort of would have forced things apart, but could have also forced people apart within the Caucasian um, community there. And I was wondering. Can you address a little bit of what the role of community was in these coming together or pulling apart? Um, generally speaking, churches don't like stampedes much, um, especially the Methodist Church, which is a teetotaling or in favor of prohibition, because um, a lot of drinking does go on. 
um, on, among everybody. Um, so they, they, generally speaking, don't like stampedes at all. They don't even want white folks to go to them. So in a sense, they're united in their disdain of all people going to stampedes. Where they do play a part is they, they play a part in the parades. Um, they'll often be a, you know, a, a prohibition or a temperance society walking in the parade. Um, and that's probably the last that anyone saw of them. I, yeah, I had a question. Um, you mentioned in 1896, I think it was, that uh, there was pay, like payment given for for participation. And uh, what I was wondering was, um, wasn't there a part, a phase in Canadian history where if First Nations people were paid off reserve, that their status was taken away? Like, do you know anything about that time period? Like, they were actually considered assimilated and therefore they were their status was taken away do you know anything about that yeah it was a little force you're talking about forcible enfranchisement and it's a little bit more complicated than just taking wages because we know aboriginal people work for wages across british columbia in this time period in alberta as well um, one thing about being paid wages off reserve is that that was money that potentially you could keep from the hands of the indian agent who was the banker Right? So this actually doing anything off reserve, earning any wages off reserve could actually keep you away from government surveillance. In the time period I'm talking about, there's very, very little, there was some, very little, but very little enforceable, enforced franchisement. So it's not, that's not a factor here, but good question. Making Luke work today. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I was just wondering about the link or any possible connection between rodeos and agricultural exhibitions because, I mean, in rural Canada, that's that's usually the major event of the year, and I would assume that, uh, and these, this is usually interpreted as a way of, you know, advertising progress and, um, you know, market integration or whatever. Exactly. And if but those exist, if, if, if the, you're, the whites are going to both, what about the natives? Are they taking any part in the... Um, the, to answer the first part of your question, at least in the first instance, in the first decade of the 20th century and into the second, rodeos are the way that fairs make money. They, they keep them afloat. Um, so they become essential to the running of fairs. And that lasts right into the 1950s. Cloverdale gets a rodeo <clears throat> after the Second World War precisely because they can't keep the agricultural society out of the red. The rodeo does that for them. Um, Aboriginal people did participate in agricultural exhibitions. Um, until the mid-1930s, they did so largely organized by the Indian agent. So the Indian agent used, various Indian agents used agricultural exhibitions as a way of showing the progress in their agency. And they, they often, in, in British Columbia, competed against each other to show how progressive their reserves were. But in the 1930s, government changes policy and starts to encourage individual Aboriginal people to enter exhibitions, um, particularly women to enter beadwork and sewing um, as a way of producing a new commodity that can be marketed from reserves that aren't not making or because of geography are not capable of making the transition to agriculture. Um, by the late 19th century, by 1898, for example, Blackfoot people are organizing their own exhibitions pretty much for the same ends as local small towns were to, to show what they were doing and how good they were progressing and how they could be farmers and therefore they were using the land that was allotted to them, and that it didn't need to be cut off and taken into you know, greater, the greater production scheme, for example. So yeah, they were drawn to exhibitions, and they ran their own. I had a question about um, early in the presentation, you said there'd be a quiz at the end. Oh, yeah, but you know the answer. I won't, I won't tell the answer. I just thought you might want to bring it up. OK, let me just. Uh, If there are other questions, I'm just going to scan back to that early image. But I and probably can multitask, maybe. I had a question yeah. about the Indian agents as well. Hmm? They sounded really loathsome in your talk. They're, I mean, they sounded like the bad guys in your talk, but then in an answer to a question, you said oh, there was a good Indian agent named Wilson, so what's the difference between a good one and a bad one? Did you find anything in your sources that 
made them seem at all sympathetic? Um, I think it's always fair to say that all these figures um, are mixed, right? I mean, Wilson, who's the blood Indian agent um, during the first world, well, before the first world war and into, I don't know, 1918, I'm not good with dates. Um, he, he's, he tries really hard to make sure that, that the blood reserve is not cut off anymore, that they keep all their land base. Um, he works hard to fund the transition, um, first to ranching and then agriculture. And he argues against that doing a transition to agriculture is actually not a good thing for that region environmentally, et cetera, et cetera. So he's, he's kind of a good guy. I mean, I think, I think a lot of these Indian agents are very ambivalent characters. Um, in cases where they live in towns and go out to reserves and travel around, they tend to have less close relationships with indigenous peoples and therefore don't have their feelings involved. Um, and they can enact more draconian measures because they don't really know the people. Flip side of that is that they're not on reserve, so they can't, they don't have the same level of control. In southern Alberta, they were on reserve and they had more control. And some of them were dastardly. Um, Indian agent Dilworth, who I quote, is a really good example. He orchestrates a fraudulent election to sell off a huge chunk of land. So they're mixed characters, but their agenda is not one that we would probably sympathize with today for the most part. Um, when I was out on the Colville Reservation, um, one of the highlights of the OMAC Stampede every year was something called the Suicide Race. And um, it was very, very interesting, a real focal point um, for activity on the reservation throughout the year. And ponies bred especially for it. And as you probably know, it's like um, this very, very fast dash down a very, very steep embankment across the OMAC River. And every few years, a couple of horses or occasionally a rider will die. But one of the things that's interesting about it is it's become um, representative um, of tradition there. Um, even though that tradition arguably doesn't really date back more than 100 years. And I was curious if there were any um, parallels in BC to well, the suicide race. The, the first thing to say about that, of course, is that I mean, a lot of British Columbia Aboriginal people go and ride in the Omax suicide race. Johnny. Um, oh, his, his name is completely coming up. Ephraim Inkamip is one of those people that, that rides. Um, in fact, he, he goes to rodeo south of the line <clears throat> where people don't know him so well, and his name is Johnny Francis. And so he sometimes enters as Francis Johnny and sometimes as Johnny Francis, so he can get two cracks at every competition. But anyway, um, no, the, I mean, the thing about rodeo is that, you know, we can argue that it's an invented tradition or that it's not a real tradition because it only goes back so far. But for people, this is... This is yet another tradition. It's an emergent tradition. Um, and there are many parallels across British Columbia. Um, in August, if you want to go to, I think, absolutely the best rodeo in British Columbia, uh, in Sokoten Territory, go to the um, Haniquatan Stampede. They're the Namaya Valley Stampede, where they too have a mountain race. Um, not quite as precipitous, and it's a, a fast-flowing creek rather than the Omak River. Um, I don't think anyone's died, thankfully, although some people have certainly being dismounted, um, and horses have crossed the line without riders. Um, but that's a really good case of where a people use the rodeo to establish themselves um, in a certain kind of way as traditional. And they talk about horse culture being traditional to so called people. Um, they ally themselves politically with horse culture. So in the land claims case that took place in the early part of the 20th century, they, argue, they argued that they needed to preserve the area to preserve the habitat for wild horses. Um, and when they announced the mountain race, they announced it as a, a traditional Sokotan expression of masculinity. So that's a, a really good, it's, I highly recommend it, first weekend of August. Um, if you want an immersion into indigenous rodeo culture, it's a good one. If there are no other questions, won't you please join me and thank you, Professor Young.